All right, hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of our ongoing Gates Air Connect webinar series. Today's webinar, Intraplex IP Link plus Max Connect, empowering STL and remote live application, is uh, presented to you by Gates Air's Tony Gervasi, with special guest, Josh Bond of Bond Broadcast Services. Um, you're gonna get more than just a discussion and slide presentation today on how to make the already ultra reliable Intraplex IP link codec platform even more reliable with broadcast design Max Connect high speed internet service. Uh, you'll get to see an actual live demonstration here today. So I think you're gonna be glad you stopped by. Before we start, let's take a quick three minute break to allow latecomers to join in to today's webinar. In the meantime, please sit back and relax, get ready for some awesome, uh, you know, Intraplex and Max Connect inform information, and we'll see you in three. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back uh, to the Gates Air Connect webinar series. This is Keith Adams, Marketing Communications Manager for Gates Air. And as always, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy day, spending it here with us. Uh, everyone's familiar with our Intraplex line of radio broadcast codecs, and the award-winning IP link platform continues to gain popularity as like a Swiss Army knife for virtually any studio to transmitter link scenario that exists. Um, uh, today's webinar is going to be a little different. It revolves around another powerful use for IP link technology, and that would be reliable remote broadcast applications. And a not so secret weapon uh, in, in, this, in today's arsenal is going to play a pretty important part with this particular application. It's called Max Connect uh, or Max Connect Wireless, um, and, and its broadcast tailored IP services are just what you need for, for uh, excellent remote broadcast stuff. So. Uh, today's webinar is Intraplex IP Link Plus Max Connect. 
Empowering STL and Remote Live Application, and it's brought to you today by Gates Air's own Tony Gervasi, who's our sales manager for Intraplex Broadcast. Um, and joining him today is Josh Bone, who's the president and CEO of Bone Broadcast Services, uh, <clears throat> who's the maker of, of Max Connect. So as always, we're going to have a question and answer session that takes place at the end of the presentation. And we encourage all of you to enter in any questions that you might have at any time um, in the live chat or top chat section directly under this video if you're watching on gatesair.com. Um, and if you're watching this directly in YouTube, it's at the right of the video. And we'll be answering these questions in a first come, first serve manner. So feel free to enter any anything at your convenience and uh, we'll hopefully get to that here in the, in the webinar. So let's let's get on to with the webinar here. So again, without further ado, here is Mr. Tony Gervasi. Tony. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Keith. I do appreciate that. Josh will be joining us in just a second because I wanted to kind of review our IPL series real quick and the Interplex series. I see a lot of people online and like, like Keith said, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and uh, jump them in on the top chat there and we'll review those at the end of the session. For the Interplex products, everybody's familiar with our in the lower left-hand corner there, the legacy stuff, the T1, E1, and multiplexer. Uh, that has been around forever, and it's been the workhorse. Uh, when we still, when I go visit facilities uh, just about every week, I see you know, 25, 30-year-old chassis still just cranking away and doing what, exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, we do have the luxury of uh, upgrading those to IP multiplexers if you want to with the CM30 upgrade kit. We could talk about those later on if anybody's interested. The IPL series, whoa. The IPL series uh, is the 100, the 100P, the 200, 200A in the upper left hand, uh, upper left hand corner. Uh, that's our current line of IPX, uh, IPL series. And then, of course, on the right hand side is the Ascent, which will be out come October. Uh, it was introduced at the NAB show. It's a scalable audio of IP platform, supports up to 16 channels of analog or digital, or we can actually do 32 channels of AES 67. And not only is it fully compatible with the IPL series, but we also use a new streaming protocol called SRT, Secure Reliable Transport, actually won an Emmy Award for new technology. It's really designed around video based, but the SRT is just extremely robust and putting in audio was just uh, just real easy for us to do. Um, and basically where UD or RTP over UDP is just like someone shouting and hopefully a receiver gets it and you use you know, forward air correction, you use buffering to make up for any losses of packet. SRT does have the ability to ask for packets back. Um, it still works as a UDP stream, but it's, uh, it's more like a UD reliable UDP transport. And of course, the HDL series, our 950 STLs. True five watts of power, not uh, not uh, digital power, but it's a true five watts of power. Uh, and it is an IP, uh, it is a UDP path. So it's capable of a, to doing up to 3.2 meg worth of bandwidth. So not only can you run audio cards on it if you wanted to, but if you ran it in full IP mode, you can integrate it with our IP links, whether you want to run a composite box or our audio box or multiple channels, you could do that over our HDL series. The Ascent, we talked about that, built on our IP link codec technology, scalable up to 32 channels and one rack unit. It's going to be available also as a software version. We'll be able to do AS3 analog and AS67 audio. Multiple to uh, point to multipoint with up to 100 destinations. Uh, network reliability using multiple IP ports, just like we use in the IPL series. Encrypted content, built-in firewall, and of all the codec codecs there, linear AAC, LC, HE, HEV2, all the good stuff that's there. Our key, link, our key IP link features are, are feature keys that are available, different encoding packs, whether you wanted to add additional AEC LCs or MPEG to it. If you wanted to add app text to it, that's a different coding screen. Stream splicing, this adds stability to groups, whether um, you only need to get this feature key on the deco side. And this is a little bit unique because not only can we do stream diversity or path diversity for stream splicing, but we also can do time diversity. So we can send one stream at multiple delays. For instance, I have a Jefferson Public Radio who has, uh, they're using DirecTV to receive at one of their AM transmitter sites. We're actually sending path diversity as well as time diversity to uh, to mitigate any issues with uh, buffering and uh, and jitter and packet loss. IP NEC, this uh, adds the ability to tunnel external data, whether it's like your E2X data or uh, any other information that you want to pass through with your audio. Live look, this is a license. Basically, again, you only need it on the decoder, but it's, it allows you to give you qualitative and quantitative information about your circuit and IP path. Synchrocast, uh, this is a, for SFN networks or 
if you're running, uh, and there are some uh, uh, NPR stations and public PBS stations that like to do alternate frequency on their RDS, this comes in handy because a lot of times when you flip from one frequency to another, you could have delays in your stations. And um, uh, they don't like to have that. Uh, stations up in San Francisco and up in the Napa Valley and, uh, and in Los Angeles that are PBS, they uh, and they do alternate frequency on, RD on RDS, they want the ability to everything be synchronized. So it's not only good for SFN broadcast, but it's also good to keep your all your stations synchronized. And then AES-192 output. Um, this enables AES-192 to be on the decoder, but it also allows our MPX box to talk to our IPL series. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> Basically, again, uh, our IPL series, every one of them flexible use of HGPIOs, highly integrated, uh, many different applications. Also easy for us to make minor adjustments for spe specific changes. Our coders sitting right in Mason, Ohio. So um, <laughs> I guess PowerPoint wants to do its own thing. So it, keep, it gives us the ability <laughs> to add some specific changes on the fly. There's three network ports with firewall capability on every unit. Hit list protection using stream splicing, hard failover for not only audio, but also IP. So we have primary, secondary, and, back, and tertiary sources, IP connect, multi-coding. This is where we could take one piece of audio uh, in the audio input, and I can send it out different codes. So I can send it linear on one path, uh, G.722 another path, shoutcast another path, and then um, uh, uh, maybe uncompressed in another. Going through our units here, the IP Link 100, this is basically our entry level unit. Uh, this would be compared to a lot of the half chassis units from other, other, uh, other suppliers. Uh, again, this gives you activity lights, tells you the inputs and outputs, audio monitor, uh, gives you my, a mirrored Ethernet port on the front. XLR is on the back, and you see you have three Ethernet connectors with USB. The USB can be used to do backup restore as well as to store audio. Eight GPIOs, RS-232 port. And of course, uh, we do have dual power supplies where the second power supply can be 48 volts or 12 volts if you'd like. The 100P is almost the same thing as the 100 with the exception of it has GPS inputs for the single frequency network. It also gives you a full active display. The 200 uh, primary is XLR, secondary is using Studio Hub. Um, and then of course, the GPIOs, dual RS-232 ports. And uh, of course, uh, 10 meg per second and one PPS for SFM. And of course, it gives you full VUs and full display. And the 200A, the secondary output here, if you notice that, is AES-67. And that is, uh, so all of our units can ingest AES-67, but only to 200A could spit it out. And that's going to be on this channel 2 output. So all of them can ingest AES-67, and then on the receive units, they would come out as AES-3 or left and right audio. And then our MPX series. The composite series allows you to have multiple composite inputs, whether it's primary through BNC analog, or you could use AES-192 uh, AS as your input. Also allows you to inject your subcarriers at your studio if you wanted to. It gives you, again, three network uh, three network ports. Does have the ability for GPS, uh, internal GPS or external GPS, AGPIOs. Uh, this is great if you want to feed composite across your HD link, and then you also want the ability to feed audio using our IPL 100, 200. So it gives you the ability to, to leverage the $15,000 audio processor you have by using composite output or AS192, feeding it to your transmitter site, your primary site, your secondary site, your tertiary site, as well as embed in your EDOX data so you can feed HD out to that direction. Or if you wanted to feed audio, you could also feed audio using the IPL series. So it just gives you lots of flexibility and it gives you the ability to leverage, again, that multi-thousand dollar audio processor that you have. We talked about our composite bandwidth, and this is something unique to the uh, IP link. Um, and, and if you look here, uh, we could sample at 132, give you audio and RDS. We use as little as 1.64 meg. That's the lowest bandwidth configuration out there by anybody that's not using micro. Uh, micro is a highly compressed uh, system. This is not compressed. This is linear audio. Um, but we can run, you know, if you wanted to run already, if you see here on the chart, we go all the way up to basically about three meg. We're comport, uh, compatible with all the IPL series, which means we can go ahead and ingest AES-192 on any of the IPLs and send it out as, uh, as uh, AES-192, and we use about 3.2 meg. Again, we talked about using the HD links, allows hit list uh, operation. If you were to use this with stream splicing, with the HD link, 
If you have a 500 kilohertz bandwidth STL license, you run 256 QAM, you're about 3.1 meg worth of audio or width of IP. So that gives you more than enough to feed EdoX data. Uh, you can go ahead and run composite across there and still run audio channels as Opus or AAC, LC, uh, or HE, or however you'd like to run it. New release that's out for the IPL series, 3.13. We'll kind of update these, and these go hand in hand with what we're doing with Max Connect. Simpler stream setup, especially when doing behind the NAT or behind an out router or connections that may be double NATing and triple NATing like your 4G connections. DHCP and automatic forward entry configuration. Enhanced input selection. So not only allows you to choose between AES3 or analog, but also dynamically choose between those. And the ability to use the second channel as a backup to the primary channel if you're using an IPL200. Programmable silent detection all the way down to minus 60. And then programmable web port, uh, web server port. So if you didn't want to use port 80 and you wanted to change the port to use, we go ahead and allow you to change, uh, change the web pay, uh, port. And then also we use our Gates Air shout, Shoutcast protocol that allows us to transport GPI audios with en uh, encoder authentication to your uh, to your streaming uh, company. Uh, and especially if you want to do point to multipoint or if you needed a, a reflector service, that's something that we could do using our Shoutcast protocol. Simpler stream setup, dynamic streams using what we call um, uh, a dynamic initiator allows us to basically create one entry in a unit and it will automatically go off hook if you would tunnel through to the receive end or to the transmit end uh, create build the paths up and then send the connections audio back and forth there are companies out there that have transversal servers which work very well but you're relying on those transversal servers to be up and running for your path to work we wanted the ability to tunnel through nats but be able not to rely, you don't have to rely on us to keep our servers up and running. So by using dynamic initiator, all you do is set up the configuration once and no matter what DHCP it gets or whoever it's using as its ISP, it'll automatically create through and uh, and connect to the end and move audio back and forth. It also works with forward air correction and stream splicing. This is something that the Kansas City Chiefs is using and they're using dynamic initiator. At the stadium, they have their unit. They have du dual systems are using MPLS and a cable uh, cable modem on the other side. And the reason why this came into play was because the MPLS, we were told, was full bandwidth. And until it worked great on Wednesday afternoons, but come Sunday during an NFL game, it would crash and burn. And what they ended up doing is we ended up creating this dynamic initiator for them to use where all they do is plug in, power on the unit, plug it into the two networks. The system automatically gets IP addresses from the DHCP server, from both the internet connection that's through cable modem and the DHCP, and then automatically builds the circuit, tunnels through and connects. When the system is turned off at the stadium or at the remote site, the streams are basically unbuilt and are cleared from the studio unit. We'll show that configuration in just a few moments. So with that, we're going to bring in Max Connect. We're going to be Josh on there. Josh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today here to the no. webinar. No problem. Thanks for having me. Josh, you there? Can you hear me? Hello? Tony? Keith, did we lose him? He's, uh, well, it seems like he's going to try to log back in. Okay. Um, yeah, but technology, folks. Um, yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and um, what I'll do is I'm going to stop this. And while we were waiting for him to come on, I'm going to jump on over to the dynamic initiator. What you'll see here is these are live units that have, one is actually sitting at my house, uh, which is this unit. And this unit is live at a transmitter site, a radio station here in Miami or West. Can Palm. you hear me, Tony? Oh, Josh, you're here. Okay. There I am. Yeah. My microphone fell asleep. <laughs> USB at its best. <laughs> uh, Josh is on the line with us uh, to join us during this connection here uh, and during this we uh, webinar. And we're talking about the reason why his system and his, if you would, APN cards work so much better 
than uh, if you were to just go get an, a, a, a car to sim, if you would, from AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon. Um, Josh, uh, we talked about Wax Connect, uh, Max Connect and why your system is better, but maybe you can tell us why I want to use yours versus anybody else's. Well, what we do is the contracts that we have with these carriers give our sims priority on the network. So if you're in a crowded situation like an NFL game, a college football game, even a high school football game, uh, the Indy 500, which we worked at, well, what was it, three weeks ago, um, we'll use that as the case. Uh, we have a customer there that did a live broadcast. They've done it for the last two years. They did their live broadcast from the infield of the track during the race. They were connected for 12 hours, 300,000 people there all fighting for bandwidth. None of the jocks could get their phones to connect, so they actually connected to the Wi-Fi on our router to do all their social media posting and everything because our box is the only LTE that would work anywhere near the track. I like to say it's uh, it's like you're going out to a Taylor Swift concert with 14,000, 14 year olds, uh, you know, trying to post Snapchats all at the same time. You're not going to get through. Absolutely. And what we have is we have a different level of priority with the carrier than pretty much anything that anyone else can get. Um, our our priority level is a about one click lower than E911 and things like that. This was developed specifically for broadcasters due to uh, the fact that we were declared as first responders. So therefore you can, um, therefore that gives us the ability to use this. It's not first net. I don't want anybody to get confused and think that this is first net, but I was able to work deals. It took me years to negotiate deals with these carriers to get us the ability to use this for audio transport, for transmitter sites, for remote control, things like that. So this cuts through the clutter in ways that nothing else that you can get will work. I mean, people, I've had people tell me, well, I have a business plan and I can get a static IP address. Sure, you can, but you're still going to get hoofed off the network if um, what you're trying, you know, if you go out to a crowded event or something like that, you're, you're still going to be fighting for bandwidth the same as everybody else. Of, you know, I'm Florida. In your product. How's it? It's our first you have because we have a higher. Um, going to get through, we have a good chance of getting those. How events you know, hurricane I run I'm saying the south running to get priority to, to first responders are we on that level um the, the the priority of the first responders during a hurricane is actually part of first net okay and we're not technically on first net now I have optioned first net and but the problem with doing that is the fact that FirstNet is based on individual agreements with each state, and you have to coordinate all of that and any deployment regarding that through a state EMA. That is a level of complexity that is very difficult and time-consuming to navigate. So if anyone decides that they want to go with that, we do have the ability to do that. So you'll get the prioritized SIMs to use normally, but then you would also have the first net option on there, which means that you would also have to use first net compatible hardware. I've not had anyone do that, um, but I can tell you if you would decide to do it, we can do it. It would just be a relatively lengthy process to get it set up. Okay. We talked about your system at, um, at transmitter sites. One of the options you guys offer is the external antennas. Yes, uh, that is a, and you'll have to pardon me as I'm, I'm trying to do this because where I was, my service was horrible. So I had to walk outside. So I'm doing this on my phone now, um, which has a max connect SIM in it. So um, the, uh, yeah, the external antennas really do make a difference. Uh, about two minutes before I jumped on here, I got a message from a customer who has a site way out in the middle of the woods in South Central Alabama. And they, uh, they couldn't get any kind of service out there. They can't get wireline service. And they were trying to figure out what they could do to get, you know, reliable telemetry and backup audio out to there. And I said, well, here, take a Max Connect out there. Well, the first one they tried was on Verizon. Verizon has no service in that area at all. And they're like, this isn't going to work. I said, no, let's try AT&T and said, here, take these two external antennas out. And he sent me a message about two minutes before I jumped on. And it was a picture of the signal meter on the router and a picture of the two antennas outside. 
and they went from having no signal to minus 69 for a for uh, an RSSI, and they did a speed test on it, and they were getting 15 down and nine up, oh, which wow. is almost unheard of for that site because cell phones don't work there. You know, regular, you know, the Verizon SIM wouldn't work there. Even AT&T cell phones, if you, if you look at your signal reading at that site, your AT&T cell phones are down like minus 114. Those external antennas pointed toward the two closest AT&T towers, which are still about 10 miles away, were enough to get him to minus 69, which for an LTE signal is incredibly good. And on the, um, the Cradle Point boxes, I know Cradle Point has a wide variety of wide selection of boxes running from a couple of hundred dollars to thousands of dollars. Right. Um, it, you can put diversity antennas on and face to two discrete cell sites, maybe one north, one south or east or west, complete opposite directions if you needed to really get two different cell sites up and running. And yeah, and that's usually what we recommend doing if you're if you're going with a single carrier, because we do have a dual carrier option, which is actually the box that Tony has in his office there. Um, but if you're going with a single carrier option, I do recommend that if you're going to use the external antennas that you do use cell mapper or open signal or something like that to find out where the actual uh, where the actual towers are so that you can aim at two different towers. Because then if you do have one tower with an anomaly, we had that in Birmingham last year where there was one tower that I had one site that was connecting to. And after months of randomly dropping offline for exactly 12 minutes, we figured out that the site had a bad, um, a bad battery backup system. So every time they would get a brownout, it would reboot the, uh, it would reboot the, the Cisco routers that were out there. So the radios would stay up. They might go off for half a second, but the routers would reboot because the battery bank was down. Well, if we would have had, and this is what we did, we put up uh, diversity directional antennas, pointed them in two different directions, and that hasn't been a problem since because now if that tower goes down, it's pointed at the other tower, so the stream never blips. Interesting. So is this expensive? No, not at all. Um, I mean, I, I take that back. It can get expensive. It's LTE data. There is no such thing as unlimited LTE data. That's probably one of the most common questions that I get asked is, well, is the data unlimited? No, because even on the unlimited consumer plans that they advertise on TV, the fine print says, we'll throttle you to 3G after 22 gigs. Well, 3G is 144K. So you're not going to get usable data from a 3G phone. Um, but, uh, you know, just as a benchmark, you know, a 10 gig plan on Verizon is 129 bucks a month. If you're just using it for occasional audio backup and, you know, telemetry and remote control and things like that, that's more than enough. That's, I mean, that's about what you would pay for a DSL. If you, if you get more than one plan for, for your company or your area, like plans pool. So if you have, uh, you know, if you have six 10 gig plans, you don't have six individual 10 gig plans. You've actually got 60 gigs aggregate in a pool. So if you have one site that needs to run, you know, full time audio on it because it's your big money maker and you want to run that as your backup all the time. My benchmark is 64K stereo streams running 24 seven burn about 26 gigs a month. Yeah. So you would need, you know, a 30 gigs minimum to not incur any overages. So if you had three 10 gig plans um, and you used one, uh, you know, you use one for occasional remotes. One was at a site where you were just using it for remote control. And one was at a site that you had to run full time audio. And that was what you were doing. Then you have enough to cover your uses and you're probably not going to incur any overages unless you did have to run long form or high bandwidth audio over it. So, you know, 10 gigs on Verizon is 129 bucks a month. 10 gigs on AT&T is 109 bucks a month. So AT&T gave me better pricing, so I passed that on to the customer. So, you know, if AT&T is available in your area, there is a there is a, a $20 difference on 10 gig plan. You know, 1 gig on Verizon is 69 bucks, 5 gigs is 99. If you need more than 10, you know, we we structure custom plans on there. Um, to be able to make that happen. But I encourage people to, if you need more than 10 gigs, to just bundle the plans together because you're not going to save much by getting 30 or 40 gigs on one SIM. And actually, you're probably, not, yeah, you're pro you might save maybe 5%. But I always try to encourage people, if you need 
a large data pool, get multiple devices. Even if you just keep the SIM cards or a USB modem or a stack of USB modems in your desk drawer, at least you have them. And then you've got that prioritized internet that you can take out and plug into to some device that you may need out of a transmitter site. You know, if you pick up a cradle point router off eBay, you can shove a UML 290 modem into it and our service will work. If you want to provide your own cradle point routers and don't buy them from us, we will gladly just sell you the SIM cards. This is, you know, the nice part about this is you don't have to deal with carriers anymore. You deal with us. We're a small company. We've been broadcasters for 25 years. If you call, you're probably going to get me or one of my two guys. And I mean, we have more people that work for us than that, but I have, you know, three specific people that are dealing with the MaxConnect product right now. That'll grow over time, but we're not the behemoth of AT&T or Verizon that you have to worry about. Well, no, that's this department. Oh, well, no, now we have to transfer you to this department. And you, you beat your head against the wall for, you know, two hours trying to get to the right person. And then they still can't help you. Right. And there's also with Crater Point, there are some of the devices that run off of 12 volts also, right? They have a 12 volt option on some of the... Uh, actually, so actually, all of Cradle Point's devices will run off 12 volts. That's the, that's the cool thing. I've actually got an AER1600 router mounted in my vehicle. That's, a, that's the, the IoT branch router. It's not even designed for mobile, but I've got that mounted in my vehicle because it has the built-in Wi-Fi and it also has the option for the dual modem. So I run dual carrier in my vehicle when I'm going down the road. And if and, you're and in your remote vehicle, you can run that as a, as a 12 volt and you can run the, the IP link as a 12 volt and have a system that's, you know, basically mobile ready to go while you're driving. Right. And we've also, you know, that's the thing. We've also got a battery pack that is a, it's a 24 volt charge, 12 volt discharge. And, you know, we, we showed that at NAB and it's, it's not on the price list yet, but it's there where we've been doing some more testing on it. But, um, you can actually go completely wireless. If you can, you know, if, if, if you put a splitter on it, you could run your IP link and run your, uh, run your IP link and run your cradle point off this battery. It's a 36 amp, 12 volt battery. Yeah, and work. you could run for, you know, I would think probably at least an hour just off that battery running both devices. You can get almost two days off of a cradle or off that battery if you're just running a cradle point on it. Uh, the IP link doesn't take that much current at all. So, I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> The thing is, the thing will just run. I mean, so, I'm I mean, sure you get more than an hour out of it. But well, I mean, that, so that I mean, you know, think about that. That, that. that is a completely wireless remote. You could literally stick that in a bag that you could sling over your shoulder and walk around and do your broadcast and talk to people and not be tethered to anything using an IP link and a cradle point with our service. Well, while I have you here, I want to show you something that we were doing. We we're talking about the NIMIC initiator, and uh, I'm, I'm going to flip on over to our to a system that's actually running uh, and had the Max Connect uh, with it. Uh, so right here, this is a this is a receive unit at my house. Um, I am picking up a signal from WBGF and uh, coming across my local port, and at uh, we're going to basically build a dynamic initiator stream real quick. And so I'm going to go into streaming and show people how to do this. This is one of the new features in 3.12. If you're familiar with this, you're used to kind of having to jumble around and move the different screens. Well, here I'm just going to go ahead and create a dynamic initiating stream. It's going to be received, and I'm going to put it on channel one as the secondary channel. So it's going to be my, my backup to the primary, which is on uh, cable modem, if you would. And I'm going to choose, so in this case, I'm going to do Opus because it is going to cross the 4G card. And... Um, Let's see, the receive port. I'm just going to put high up so I don't interfere with anything. And under the advanced tab, this is where we have our signal mode, and this is where we choose dynamic initiator. And now, if you notice, it changed some of the screens here. So now this is telling me what interface port I'm going to go out, um, out of here. And then this is the interface port that I'm initiating on the far end. And here's the IP address that I want to talk to. So the IP address that I want to talk to on the far end... Now, it's important that one of the two ends is usually a fixed IP address, and usually the studio end is going to have a fixed IP address, but that gives you the ability to go ahead and, and tunnel through. AUX data is whether or not you're running RS-232. Uh, of course, I'm going to select, I'm going to go out uh, WAN, uh, I'm going to go out the management port here, and over here on the far end, it's WAN 1. Now, 
we have to use authentication ID, and this is a little bit different here when you set this up. Authentication ID is basically a secure key that's on every stream. And because we can send multiple streams over one UDP port, we basically segment them out by using the authentication key. So that just could be any type of you know key that you want to put in. But both ends need to match in order for it to, to send the stream. I'm just going to put a bunch of fives in. Max codec rate. Though, well, in this case, because we are using a 4G card and I want to limit the amount of bandwidth that I'm using on that far end, here's where I could select what the codec rate is going to be. And Josh, you said, you know, 96. Well, I, I'm going to choose 128 here. Sure. Um, and then, of course, this is on the far end. This is me saying I'm going to talk to channel one on the far end. I want the audio from the far end to be on from channel one. No forward air correction, or you could add. Uh, forward air correction. I ran this at the NAB, ended up running uh, streaming audio from WBGF to the floor of the NAB, and uh, I ran about 25% forward air correction, and then time delay if you needed to add a time delay. So I'm just, I don't need to forward, run a forward air correction here, and I'm going to apply that. So what I did now is I went ahead and created the dynamic initiator, and once I connect that, it's going to go ahead and connect to the far end. Oh, I'm ready. I already built it, I bet you. Yes, I did. <clears throat> Sorry about that, guys. Now, something else to keep in mind while you're reconfiguring, Tony, is on yep. the Max Connect, they all include a static IP address. There's nothing special that you have to do to get that. Every SIM that we sell, every SIM, SIM that we send, whether we just send you a SIM or whether we send you a fully configured router, there is a, a public static IP address that never changes based on location or anything like that that's on there. So if you do have a site that doesn't have a static IP, your Max Connect will. So therefore, if you need to initiate, or if you need to have that uh, static IP for dynamic initiator, the Max Connect could be your base for that. Right, and your max, and you're using your cradle point to send. Uh, it has a uh, sending out DHCP. Correct. Out DHCP, because if you notice here, you on the mat. This is the max connect modem. It's giving me a one o not o dot one ninety six uh, that I'm using to actually talk to the outside world. Uh, so that's yes, it has a fixed IP, but I'm using the cradle point in DHCP mode. Right. Okay. So now. Now that I've built the dynamic initiator and the stream connected, you can see right here a DR for that's a dynamic receive uh, for the dynamic initiator being sent to my local IP address through WAN1, and here I'm receiving it. So it's a man in a backup, and you can go ahead and alarm these. So you can say if this alarm, if this fails, this will automatically initiate connect and stream over. And it takes about five seconds for it to build up, tunnel up, build the streams and reconnect. But the good thing is if you want to send this box out, if you want to send a 100 unit out, which again is you know our entry level unit, and you want to send that out in the field with a max connect, you can pre-configure this. So as soon as it turns on, it's going to go connect to the far end and give you your audio back and forth. And that's one of the neat things about being able to run the max connect box with dynamic initiator is that you're up and running immediately. There's no, oh, I got to go log in and set this and set that. Once you set it, it's, you know, what's Ron Papil say, set it and forget it? Well, absolutely. that's what you do here is you set it and forget it. And um, some of the other features in 3.12 we talked about is being able to go ahead and set the web port, whether you know, there it is on, we wanted to change the, uh, the web page configuration. Uh, before, we had to make entries in the forwarding table. Now, you don't have to because once, if you set the gateway, it will automatically make the entries in the forwarding table for you. Uh, so that kind of saves some configuration issues. Uh, some, and again, once you build it, it's there. Um, and also uh, setting up um, uh, upgrading is easy just by doing your upgrade firmware. You could do it from a USB stick or you could do it right from, uh, right from the computer itself. So 3.12 is available. You can contact me directly if you're for your IPL. Depending on what flash and firmware version you're running, uh, or a firmware version while you're running on the boot ROM, uh, there's either it's either a one-step process or a two-step process, uh, and we have a, a page for that that basically gives you the instructions on what versions you're running and whether it's a one-step or a single step. But um, we're going to open it up to Q and A's here in a few seconds. Uh, but Josh, I want anything else you want to touch about real quick before we go to Q and A? I think that covers most of it. Uh, you know, if anybody has any, if anybody wants more information, you can always log on to uh, to our website, uh, Max Connect Wireless with two X's and a K, or uh, BoneBroadcast.com. There's a little form on there you can fill out for more information. 
Excellent. And let's see if we have uh, any Q and A's here, Keith. So yeah, um, really, again, if anybody is there on the line, uh, filling out the live chat or the top chat section below, that's where you can put in some questions. Um, we'll answer them in a first come first serve manner. I know there's at least one. Um, and uh, just a little bit of housekeeping real quick. Uh, this this webinar is going to be available here on gatesair.com and on our YouTube channel later today. So the same links that you use to view this live presentation are going to work for viewing the recording if you ever want to come back and, and uh, kind of review this for a little more detail. And in addition, we're also going to be adding this webinar to our educational video library at gatesair university.com, which is our online hub of lessons and webinars about broadcast engineering. Um, we encourage you to visit and browse through a lot of this great material. Um, we're, we're trying to make it uh, bigger and better as time goes on. So any kind of topics that you have for us for future webinars or things you'd want to see um, to help you in your broadcast needs, run them past us for sure. Keith, if um, I remember correctly, these webinars are good for a half a credit for SBE recertification, correct? You you remember entirely correctly because that's a that's probably one of the best things about it is that it's not just something to look at. Um, of course, it is great to always learn, but yeah, the 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 beauty is for sure this does help you for SBE recertification. Um, every every webinar, including this one, so um, so yeah, th that's that's a great point. So thanks, Tony. So yeah, um, on to the questions. Um, there uh, earlier on, um, GBS one zero four three. I'm using the, you know, the the Google account name, so that one was pretty easy to pronounce, acronym and number. But GBS one zero four three asked, um, how reliable would you say the system is, and and do you need a backup system? And I think that that was prior to really you guys getting into the meat and potatoes so are they talking I, about uh, talking about the, uh, the 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 max connect cradle point combination the ipl combination or a little bit of both i would i'd say a little bit of both because this was prior to you even getting into um the details of those systems well i know with you know um one not only am I the sales guy, but I'm also an end user. I have three radio stations that I use the IPL series on. Um, the IP links are, you know, three Ethernet ports, dual power supplies. Um, you know, their appliances, they're designed to work as, you know, 24-7, 365. Um, you know, these are robust boxes. I mean, Interplex is known for its reliability. Um you know, there are, as with softwares, we're constantly, software, we're constantly doing upgrades on the units to make them better. Mm -hmm. um, are there, are there, you know, do, do failures happen? Of course, I mean, failures happens with every, with everything. Um, but, you know, they're minimal. And, and if somebody wants to have backups, sure. Um, we have large installs. I, we have lost, you know, Los Angeles, um, I was running a, a lot of these systems and across major network across all the the major companies in la uh boston philadelphia uh in combination of ipls and hdls uh you know if your station has the luxury to have a backup sure you you know you definitely want to have another path uh but these give you the ability to do that also with the ipl series you know there's three ethernet ports so you can have you know you can use max connect as a tertiary or a secondary it was with your mpls or your comcast or your your you know charter as your primary um so that gives you the ability to have multiple paths and with stream splicing on the ip link series if we're receiving two audio sources coming in you know uh, two different paths or th three different paths we could stream all we could splice all that together and give you one contiguous output what we like to call hitless operation so mm -hmm. we have stream redundancy and stream splicing available stream redundancy is two di two dissimilar streams one let's say one compressed one uncompressed one's a main one's a backup but one fails it automatically flips over to the other immediately you can have both of them nailed up at the same time it'll be a one second switch over um so and a max connect you know the cradle point boxes i've had cradle points for for a long time they're reliable i, I josh have you seen any cradle points fail no i i mean i've had a few that have you know if they were physically damaged they would they would still work but they would fail eventually um but uh, you know as far as max connect there's no magic in the hardware uh, you know it, it's all in the service 
And, you know, the, the carriers, you know, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile have invested billions of dollars in keeping their networks up. So your mean failure rate is minuscule compared to most wireline services. Because, you know, how often do you lose data to your cell phone in an area where you normally have data to your cell phone versus how often does your DSL go out or your cable goes out or even your T1? I mean, it, you know, that's the thing that T1s, I, I've had guys tell me, oh, T1s are tariffed and, you know, they have to fix them within the SLA and blah. well, good luck finding somebody that's actually going to be able to know how to fix a T1. You know, that's why, that's why Gates Air has developed the IP links and the original, you know, T1, E1 intraplexes are going away because T1s are expensive and they're not nearly as reliable as they used to be. But Our be, service stays yeah, they, up in, they, in, you know, most cases, whenever you would normally have service, not to mention the fact that if a tower goes down or there is an outage, you know, the carriers are working on it immediately because if you don't have ser service, chances are 10 to 15,000 other people don't have service and they already know and they're working on it. So there's no tickets that you need to put in. You just have to understand that the carriers, the carriers, when they do have failures, which is usually rare, um, they're going to get it fixed within an hour or two maximum. Right. And the and the um and in our case where the the chassis are that run in the common module the CM five or if you have a you know an older unit that's running the CM three which is running the T one common modules, uh, we still have the ability with the same chassis to put a CM thirties modules in there and create that as an IP box. Uh, though it's I don't think that would be workable on a cradle point because you're going to need one point five meg of low latency on that. So that would be good if you. Right an MPLS circuit or something along those lines where the IP box or the IPL series is designed to work across the, you know, the public internet, um, private line internet, and even in this case, the 4G. Right. All right. Um, Eric Schechter asked uh, what flavor of AES67 is supported, um, and specifically he was pointing out, um, wondering about Dante. Well, it's a, it, it is AES67 compatible. So it will talk to anything that will talk AES 67. So that would be your Wheatnet and your Livewire and Dante and Ravenna and all that good stuff as long as they're, they're, they're AES 67 compatible. We are not you know, specific to a particular brand uh, using all the hooks, if you would, if you're using like the Wheatnet box or a Livewire or what have you. Um, uh, but if it's talking AES 67 and we got the IP addresses back and forth, we will talk AES 67. Awesome. Um, KAXE engineer um, pointed out that um, they don't see the version 3.1 um, uh, on the Gates Air website, uh, you know, for the... Uh... Drop me an email directly. I will go ahead and send you 3.13. Uh, 3 uh, again, uh, there's some specific... Uh, 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 specific instructions we need to send with that. And I'll also make sure that I get someone from tech support to put it up on the web page so you can, it can be downloaded. I would say, give me a day or two for that to happen. Awesome. Um, Ghostwriter 6699 uh, just says, excellent demo guys. And thanks it has to run to another meeting. Um, and, and Eric also said, thanks. Cause he has to run. Um, Roz Clark had a question about whether there were any plans on, supporting umpx micro mpx no probably not oh, micro. <laughs> um, micro, micro mpx is what 320k it's highly compressed uh you know we 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 pride ourselves on having the lowest bandwidth out there for running aes 192 which is you know 1.62 meg or 1.64 um and you know and that is uncompressed audio so i don't foresee us doing micro mpx uh, you know, stereo separation, all of that stuff, uh, when you start taking away, suffers. So uh, we wanted the ability to have as clean, a, clean as audio as possible and the lowest data rate. And, uh, you know, and I think everybody else is up in the three meg and we're, you know, we're the lowest with the 1.64. Again, that is uncompressed. Uh, we're not we're not compressing the audio to make it uh, the three, you know, the 380 was it 364, 380k for the micro. I guess there's a market for it, but I don't see us. Um, I don't see us supporting that um, for that for fidelity reasons. Um, uh, there was another. I saw one other question. Oh, email. Uh, it's Tony at gatesair.com. T O N Y period G E R V A S I at gatesair.com. And I was cool and decided to type it in for people, if oh. that's all right. 
That works. So, um, so yeah. Um, yeah, and in, in fact, I see that it is we're getting right we're pretty close to the uh, to the three o'clock point here, Eastern Standard Time. Um, it's great you guys have the contact information here on the screen. Um, but again, uh, yeah, just if, if people have any questions and concerns, it, this is the the information you guys prefer for contacting. Yep. 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 Cool. Um, there is another question that just came in from Ron Thompson. Um, and this one I, I would assume is for Josh. Uh, do you have a trial cost solution? Uh, recommendations for advanced testing at a tower site where we aren't sure if either carrier will, will work? Um, and that's, that's why I guess he's asking for trial solutions. Basically, yeah, we can we can work something out like that. It's usually pretty short term. You know, the cost on it, you know, the, the cost on a low data plan just to test everything. If you if you, we were to do that, you know, I mean, I've got 500 meg plans just for testing that I can send out and then we can ramp it up to something else later um, if you would decide to get it. But, yeah, we, we can work something like that out. What I'll typically do is um, in a case like that, I would load both SIMs into a cradle point router, like an IBR 600 or something like that. And then, um, you know, when you decided to go to that site, you know, contact me while you're there or before, and um, we can go over how, how you can log in and enable one carrier and disable the other because the new cradle point modems with the latest firmware have auto carrier selection in there. So you disable the Verizon SIM and it automatically loads the firmware the, for the AT&T SIM. And then you disable the AT&T SIM and it will automatically load the firmware for the Verizon SIM. Um, and you have one in, in SIM one, the SIM one slot and the other in the SIM two slot. So, you know, it's a bit of a process to test them both in the same box, but it, I mean, it may take 30 minutes and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. And then if, if for some reason it doesn't work at your site, um, you know, with the standard configuration, then, uh, you know, we kind of go from there, whether you want to try external antennas or, you know, a different location or whatever. If not, then, you know, just send it back to us and, you know, we all stay friends. What would, uh, what was that webpage again to do cell site search so around his tower site? Oh, um, uh, uh, there's two of them. They're apps. Um, Open Signal is the most popular one. And then Cell Mapper is the other one. If you have any service on your cell phone, you can bring up the different carriers on there and it will actually use the compass built into your phone. You've got to make sure you have a phone that has a compass built into it because there's some cheap knockoff droids that don't. We learned that the hard way a couple of years ago. Um, that uh, it will actually, it'll figure out where you're at based on position and use the compass and it will show you what towers are, where the towers are, how far away they are, what carriers are on them and things like that. So plus if you, I mean, the, the standard AT&T and Verizon coverage maps are actually re pretty accurate for what we've got. And I've had customers pull in signals from, you know, up to 25 miles away using directional antennas mounted, you know, 20 feet up the tower. As long as you can clear the tree line and the horizon, then, you know, you can, you can hit a signal with a, a 17 dBi Yagi pointed at a cell site. Great. Thank you, Josh. Sure. All right. Um, currently don't have any other questions, but uh, again, it looks like we're uh, towards can, the end. I can here. sing if you'd like. That's, you know. That, that, that would uh, that'd definitely be awesome. Um, we can have that a, would clear That would clear everybody off the call. <laughs> uh, I, like I said, I'll do a little bit of beatboxing, which is something I can't do, and we'll, we'll make it <laughs> doub doubly terrible. Just have um, a high old time. Yes, and, and it will be recorded uh, on our YouTube channel and on gatesair.com if you're interested in <laughs> coming, <laughs> coming back to, to learn, um, you know, about this awesome technology for, you know, for making sure you've got things covered um, in your STL remote live application and bad singing and beatboxing. Um, and again, it'll also be at gatesairuniversity.com. So feel free to stop by and let us know what you think about that site. Um, we're also uh, in a few weeks here, we'll give you a little bit more information um, on an actual date and time. But the next webinar in the Gates Air Connect webinar series is about the Flexiva FMXI 4G, which is our uh, really easy path towards HD radio deployment. Um, it is a, it's basically an embedded um, importer exporter um, that is true 
um, true fourth generation HD radio. Um, we work with Xperi to make sure that it's 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 real and and uh, really easy to deploy and powerful. So yeah, that will be coming up in mid July, and we'll make sure to send out some information about that. In fact, if you have any other topic ideas for future webinars and and things that you'd like us to to talk about. Um, please let us know. You can let me know directly. Again, I'm Keith Adams, uh, keith.adams at gatesair.com or marketing at gatesair.com, which is, uh, you know, equally easy to spell, I think. Um, so yeah, if there are any other things you guys want to, to say, I think we can, uh, mark this one up in the history books. Thank you very much for uh, participating, Josh. I appreciate it. Look forward to working with you <laughs> moving forward. And thanks uh, to all of our Interplex users out there. And uh, I look forward to working with you guys and moving forward. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. Take care, guys. Take care. Yes, have a great day. And uh, let's stay connected. Bye. Bye-bye.